Hey, everybody. So let me give you a little bit of background about myself. And Marie did a great job um, giving you some background, but I am a tech educator by training. I am a self-taught technologist. So I work at New York Public Library and I predominantly work with people who are blind, low vision, or have other print reading disabilities who have technology literacy questions. Um, what we do at New York Public Library is we do free technology coaching powered by blind and low vision and print disabled volunteers and staff. I currently coordinate three staff members and about a dozen volunteers. Marco, who's in the audience, is one of them. And we do one-on-one -on -one tech coaching for people's everyday questions about technology, such as uh, how to use Siri, how to learn to type after vision loss, how to use G Suite and Office and p deal with PDFs that aren't accessible and all the way up into more ambitious things like creative coding and doing uh, Zoom as a host, doing social media as a, a creator. So we really run the gamut. But what ties everything that we do together is that our orientation is person-centered, it is sales-free, we try our best to be objective or to be honest with patrons about what sub subjectivities we have. Um, and we believe in the capabilities of blind and low vision and print disabled people. So it's been my pr pleasure to be at the library for, uh, for about 10 years. And I tell you about my background so that you can know where I'm coming from. Um, I get to have little adventures in academia sometimes, and I get to come to these conferences and I do some speaking and writing, but what I'm doing most of the time on an average day is working with blind and low vision New Yorkers who have technology questions. And so I'm seeing a lot of this uh, consumer oriented accessibility AI hitting our community um, pretty substantially right now. And we are starting to deal with these questions on the ground in real time. And so I hope that that perspective can be helpful. Um, I forgot to do my visual description. Um, so I feel awkward about visual description. So I'm, I made it worse. Uh, I'm, I'm a blind, I'm a blind woman in my, uh, early forties and my eyes move around whenever they want to. I have long blonde hair, but what you really need to know is that I have a pin that says my social battery. And right now it's at about 80%. Um, so that's accessible now. I guess anytime I slide it, I have to give a new visual description. Um, so what I'm hoping to do today is zoom way out first and sort of make some provocations around what I think many of us, those of us in this room and the general public and the people who create AI demos are saying or acting as though we hope for in the realm of AI for accessibility. And then I wanna revisit these attributes that I think I hear a lot that people are hoping for and sort of unpack what values they might be in tension with and what, what these values might really mean, what these attributes right, might really mean in practice, why it is complicated to make AI for accessibility that's beneficial and free from harms. So I'm gonna do that for half of our time, maybe a little less than half of our time. And then I'm gonna zoom way in and talk about issues that I'm seeing in real life on the ground that are happening right now that are much more specific. So I hope that that can be helpful. So my first uh, content slide up here is, what are we looking for in AI? And this isn't a definitive framework or anything. This is what I'm hearing from consumers, from patrons, from promoters of AI some of the things that it seems like we have in our imaginary of what we want AI to do in the future. So the first one is that AI is omnipresent. It draws from rich context to support individuals. It's there when you need it. AI is easy. It can be used by anyone and it meets the user right where they are. It's adaptive. It receives and delivers information in ways that work for individual users. It's evolving. It constantly learns and grows using increased context to improve its capacities. It's active. It makes choices and takes actions on users' behalf. And it's hopefully benevolent. 
AI serves individuals and serves the common good, however you define that. So let's get into how these attributes that many of us seem to want might create some tensions. So what do we get if we get what we wish for? Let's first look at omnipresence. AI scales to be available in most interactions that we have whenever we want it. And this is coming. We know that it's coming because co-pilots being aggressively pushed. Um, Gemini is going to be hooked up to Google Workspaces. We know this. Um, we are seeing demos like Google's uh, recent demo of uh, real-time call monitoring for scam calls. So it's reaching into phone conversations. We know that it's reaching into written communications. Um, and we can expect to see more interconnectedness and more omnipresence, particularly when uh, phones and PCs are marketed with generative AI that replaces the previous generation of conversational assistance. So that's where we're at. So the tension as I see it here is that what is available may become customary or may become compulsory. And I think it's important for us to be aware as folks with disabilities, and we'll talk more about this later, that we have really compelling use cases to, 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 to offer when it comes to AI marketing. Um, and we could be a wedge that lets other things in the door. So let's consider, for example, an AI that aligns Let's consider an AI that aligns your writing at work with house style and tone at a company. Um, on, my, on my cranky days, this is something that I might want. I have sometimes pulled up ChatGPT to help me take the spice level down on an email. Um, and it's something that could very well be marketed to people who are ADHD, people who are neurodiverse, people who are speakers of other languages. So let's imagine that we have this tool that makes gentle suggestions and aligns your work to house tone and style in the company where you work. Will people with disabilities to whom this technology is marketed be nudged or required to use its output? We know under the ADA that we have the right to refuse reasonable accommodations, but will there be social pressure, pressure there for certain people to use tools of this type? And if tools of this type work well, if that tone and alignment improvement is substantial, how long is it before everyone uses a tool like this? We already know that tools that are attractive and compelling to the general population very easily propagate out from disability culture. So that happened with OCR. Optical character recognition is used to digitize almost everything these days. Uh, and text-to-speech is used to power this generation of conversational assistance. And that's just a couple, of, a couple of examples. So we know that disability technology propagates out. So we need to be aware that anything that is created for the use case of disability, if it serves somebody's business interests, it's going to propagate out. And we have to ask ourselves about the ethics of that and what kind of uh, ecosystem we're creating by letting that in. So let's talk about ease. AI becomes a beginner-friendly, versatile accessibility tool. So if you watched any of the ChatGPT4 Omni demos last week uh, or a couple weeks ago, um, you saw demos that really highlighted the frictionlessness. We're gonna have a real-time conversation. It's gonna be really easy. You can interrupt it. You can turn on a dime, change your topic, ask for more or less of something. Um, and an AI like this supports tasks. We, we have like composition, creating writing, creating a speech, summation, understanding the salient points in, uh, in some content, description, and recommendation. I'll admit to using AI for book and film recommendations sometimes. So here's the thing, when an accessibility tool becomes easy, we need to look at the impact that that's gonna have on vocational and educational systems and the actors within it. 
Um, if you zoom out to what's going on in the blind community in the last 30, 40 years, we have unfortunately seen a substantial decline in the use of Braille. It's really hard to give you a statistic on that. The folks who are here from AFB can tell you more about that. They have a whole report on how hard it is to get that statistic. Um, but what we do know is that the use of Braille has declined despite the fact that Braille gives us precision and one-to-one -one correspondence and a fluidity that we don't always have with text-to-speech. And the main reason why this is, is that uh, report technologies and screen reading technologies have gained dominance. And because they are more approachable to sighted folks uh, and have less costs built around them traditionally, uh, Braille is in many school systems and in many, many adult vocational rehabilitation settings where nearly blind people come, um, Braille is uh, less emphasized. And conversely, using text-to-speech as your primary literacy medium has become normalized. What I'm seeing at the library is that the current generation of recent high school graduates who are not coming from a background of maximal privilege are often using iPads to get through most of their coursework. And we're seeing kiddos that are graduating whose primary way of outputting text is dictation. And this is even though they don't have any kind of cognitive reason or physical reason why they couldn't do typing. And so one thing that we can expect to see is that to the degree that AI tools are easier, easier to introduce, easier to teach, and easier to let a student quote unquote self-support, um, we can expect to see these sneak into and become normalized in educational and vocational workflows. And we need to ask ourselves in what situations is that okay and actually empowering? And in what situations are we replacing a process that has cognitive, innate cognitive merits, which I would argue that uh, proofreading and note-taking and things like that absolutely do. Um, so when we replace, uh, when we introduce AI, are we undermining the development of any kinds of cognition and, and cognitive skill? Yes, I understand. Spoiler alert, probably so. Uh, so onward to my next item. So we like to think of AI as adaptive. Um, I One of my favorite things about AI, I'll just be real with you. There are about four or five descriptive AI tools. Everybody knows what one of them is. Everybody knows Be My AI because Be My AI was first. We now have Envision Assistant, Ira Access, I'm counting on my fingers up here because I can't even keep track of them all anymore. Um, oh, Seeing AI has one. Uh, and there's one called uh, PeakyBot. Uh, and there's probably more. So there's this profusion of descriptive AI products. And one of the things that I love about them is they will let me address a basic inaccessible situation, like a meme that's not accessible or a graphic that's not accessible and get instant uh in instant output that's accessible. One of the things that I'm really excited about is the potential for AI on my side, on the client side, to remediate accessibility in more situations. So if I'm in a graphical user interface that doesn't have labeled elements, boy, would I love to have those elements labeled and then be able to take actions on them. The thing is, though, that when we use accessibility tools that are powered by a AI on the fly to remediate our own accessible situations, um, we are probably lending our enthusiasm to potentially a business case for deploying a product or service that uses uh, AI to make accessibility better. So our enthusiasm for accessibility AI tools might be leveraged to make a business case for using them on a systemic level. Um, one of the places where I'm the most concerned about this is in the case of accessibility overlays. So if you've been paying attention to the discourse in blind culture since around 2017, 
um, accessibility overlay companies promise to quote unquote, quote unquote fix your website with one line of code. Um, and they do that by using artificial intelligence and machine learning to reprocess things and re-render them in the user's browser. Tends to use a lot of system resources, might provide uh, some privacy exposures between the user and the company, um, but more to the point may not fully work. So for example, an AI may misapply semantic structure, heading structure, uh, mistag links, misalign uh, table and, and column and row information, and uh, fail to detect nuance in uh, graphics. And even though AI remediation is unquestionably getting better, um, my feeling is that it is still really important to have more accessible content and to understand web content accessibility guidelines and nat native mobile guidelines and use them in all software and hardware deployment because that's gonna provide a more consistent experience, because that is going to be more privacy preserving for the user, because that is going to preserve the user's ability to opt out of AI. Um, and if you'd rather be mercenary about the whole thing, um, because writing accessible code now will give us tomorrow's training data. <laughs> so I'd like to encourage us all to be very wary of business cases that promise to deploy AI to remediate accessibility on a scaled systemic level, um, and instead to advocate for AI accessibility tools that can be used as individual tools and workarounds. And I think what's at the heart of this one is just user discretion. Let's talk about evolving. AI builds conceptual fluency over time. AI draws on a corpus of knowledge and opinion that contains biases and gaps. Um, so we know that AI is constantly, quote unquote, learning is constantly processing and remixing things and evolving. And what's challenging about this, what creates attention in my mind is that as we become more used to receiving AI mediated information, it's important to remember that the provenance of AI answers and decisions is really hard to trace, way more hard to trace than information that we got from a Google search or from a database. Um, and I also want to point out, I'm going to be talking in a little while about some situations where large language models in particular can show explicit and implicit bias. Um, and the talking point tends to be that LLMs just need better guardrails. Um, but you know, when you see a guide dog and you know you're not supposed to pet that guide dog and you tell yourself, I'm not going to pet that guide dog and you don't say anything about that guide dog, you are guard railing yourself. You have not stopped thinking about the guide dog. You are still processing and acting or reacting or thinking in some way that's influenced by that guide dog. So even though an LLM may have guardrails, the guardrails are helping, they're prescriptive. They're helping an LLM decide what not to say. They're not revealing any implicit bias that might silently continue to guide answers. Um, so guardrails are like filters. They are prescriptive. They are not curative of any bias or knowledge gaps that is in the data sets. So, I feel that large language models are destined to replicate the marginalities and disadvantages that are already reflected in the training data. Um, and now LLMs are exposed to LLM output. You know, the cycle is, is speeding up. Um, and so that can mean that once some mis misinformation and biased information um, spreads, via LLM content, it can become very, uh, it can become ubiquitous and hard to extinguish very quickly. I, I believe that a lot of us hope and think that AI tools will be active. They will curate information for users. 
cut through the noise, if you will, and take action on our behalf. But here's the thing, when an AI tool misbehaves, who is liable? Um, my least favorite game working in the nonprofit sphere is finding out who is to blame for a piece of accessibility failure. Um, I work at a library and without hanging any of our dirty laundry up to dry, um, we, you know, we procure relationships with databases and third party services and frameworks. And so when we discover an accessibility failure, it becomes a conversation with us internally that then moves to a third party vendor. The third party vendor may themselves have frameworks that they rely on. And so a lot of time is spent before any remediation happens, um, figuring out where an accessibility issue originated and whose job it is to fix it. Accessibility AI might scale this problem. So will these tools help businesses avoid direct accountability? I can imagine, and I actually don't have to imagine because it's happened to me when I've attempted to use accessibility overlays, um, that when I communicate with a business to say, hey, this accessibility overlay is not working, I can't access your content, they say, thanks for letting us know, that's actually in our overlays jurisdiction, we've, we've submitted a report. Um, and so having that extra layer and not creating directly accessible infrastructure because AI is there to do the remediation can be a way of sheltering businesses, I believe, from accountability. Um, another thing that I wonder is what constitutes informed choice when the actions an AI tool recommends aren't fully explainable. So I'm working with a lot of patrons that have uh, a relatively low level of literacy when it comes to technology, and they would love to have a conversational interface that, um, that, that answers their questions and aids them in research that they need for themselves, for their jobs, for their roles in civil society and as a, a members of a family. Um, the thing is, even when an AI engages in reference and citation, we don't really know what factors led a certain reference or citation to be surfaced rather than another. And we also don't always know that the relationship between the information we're reading and that reference and citation is valid. And so when there's so much black boxing going on, what constitutes informed consent to these actions that are be being taken on our behalf? And then lastly, I wanna talk about benevolence. Um, so AI tools serve in our imaginary, I think, the interest of the user and avoid calling, causing harm. Um, that is the hope. But my question is, whose interests are really served when, uh, when, for example, data is retained versus discarded. There's one really obvious tension between the individual user and the ultimate goals of AI, which is, um, are we furnishing training data for the next generation of models? How is our data being used? Is the information about our data use um, readable and parsable by the average person? And is that information valid? And are the security protocols, um, do they live up to the statements that companies are making? So there's a real tension here. And I'm not as worried about it, maybe I should be, but I'm not as worried about it as say a chat GPT user. Um, but I, what I am really concerned about is workers, students, conference attendees, and people who are in relation to an entity um, may unwittingly start contributing to the next generation training data and doing so may be part of the terms of engagement for a job, um, an educational institution or participation in some other event. Um, we know, we all know that this recently happened with Reddit, that Reddit was scraped without user consent for a lot of training data. And I expect to see more about that. And again, the reason why this is an accessibility uh, issue is that a very um, strong case can be made for accessibility AI, and then that lets other things in the door. Accessibility, the word accessibility and the feelings around accessibility can be uh, used, I think, to normalize a lot of data retention that otherwise might not fly. Um, let's see here.
there are some other situations where I feel that uh, individual interests and the interests of corporate entities may come into tension. So there's a really legitimate tension between the need to describe or simplify copyrighted material that's inaccessible um, and the need to prevent LLMs from scraping copyrighted material. It's one of the great ironies right now that ChatGPT, who's being sued by the New York Times and, and, and uh, all kinds of folks, um, at the same time, if I upload a, a thoroughly inaccessible PDF and say, you know, read me pages three through five, it says, I'm so sorry, I can't do that. It's copyrighted. You can't have it. Um, so there is some prioritization of interests there. OpenAI seems to be able to get all the content it needs, but it's not necessarily letting us surmount that guardrail on an in uh, individual level, nor do I know if it should. Um, we saw in uh, at the Google I.O. conference last week a tool that detects perceived threats in real time, like a scam call that's in progress. This... Uh, technology that they were de demonstrating was using a local large language model running on a phone. So conceivably it's less of a red flag for security than it sounds. Um, but it's a really powerful use case, particularly thinking about vulnerable adults, people that may have cognitive impairments, people that um, may not have all the digital literacy context it's a powerful proposition to protect these people from threats by monitoring phone calls. Um, but monitoring phone calls is not something that we have historically wanted or allowed. And so I see this as yet another wedging of a powerful accessibility use case um, to nudge people towards acceptance of a tool that until now would have felt very invasive. Um, and I think a lot of that marketing that's happening around accessibility and protection um, is happening very consciously. Uh, so simply put, who defines the interests that an AI will serve? All right, so I'm gonna get, I'm done with abstract stuff and I wanna give you a whirlwind tour of what's happening on the ground right now, what we are experiencing. So I'm gonna tell you one quick story that's not really about AI, it's about an algorithm. But the reason why I'm telling you this story is that what we put into training data will manifest as code, as advice, as algorithmic decision-making, machine learning decision-making at a later time. Um, what we are putting in now will be reflected in, in LLMs because LLMs know us by what we've done, know us by our training data. So I went to New Orleans in 2022 to a convention of about 3,000 blind people. Was anyone there? Yay. Okay. So this hotel had destination elevators. So good news, they had an accessibility panel and an accessibility algorithm. If you approach the accessibility panel and press the accessibility button, a couple things would happen. One, you'd hear your uh, your floor announced back to you and you'd hear what car your elevator was arriving on. So it would direct, you know, go to car B to your, your front left. So far, so good. Um, the folks that designed the algorithm that went along with this elevator system probably had never um, anticipated that there might be a convention of 3000 blind people. So what they did is to make it easier for us, if you press the accessibility button, then only elevators near you would come for you. Elevators on the other end of the, the bay would not come for you because, you know, it just makes life easier for us. And then the algorithm meant that if you had pressed the accessibility button, when the doors opened, they would just give you a bunch of extra time until the doors closed. I'm sure that when they tested this with two or three or four blind people, everyone was very appreciative and said, yes, that sounds, that sounds okay. And then we got there on the first day, there are several hundred of us pressing the button and we said to each other, has anybody noticed that the elevator seemed a little slow? <laughs> and then the other 2000 of us showed up and suddenly the elevator bays were filled with people 
who were saying things like, I've been in here for half an hour. Has anybody seen the stairs? And the moral of the story is a helpful assumption that is a biased assumption, which is that blind people are slow for one, and that blind people, when they show up, are going to show up in manageable numbers. Um, that kind of thing is implicit bias. It is all over the place in our culture, and we can expect to see it in the training data going forward, except that once in once it is in the training data, that flawed assumption, um, it'll be reflected in the AI outputs, but it'll be probably a little bit hard to find. So we can't fix AI's bias without fixing the cultural bias that we are producing. All right, next up, I wanna talk about Be My AI. So to be clear, I love Be My AI. It solves a lot of problems for me. Uh, it creates a lot of problems for me too, but that's fine. Um, one thing that a lot of us have been really rejoicing in is, be is being able to go through our photo roll and post our pictures to social media. And that alt text is already written for us. And we are seeing, if you're blind and you're on social media, you'll pro you're probably seeing a ton of these posts that have a certain type of uh, what I'll call Pleasantville language. Um, so anything that has a couch or a blanket in it is cozy. If we have a child, we have uh, we have curious or joyful. Um, if we have a puppy, we have heartwarming. Um, and the worst that anything ever is is cluttered or chaotic. Um, so the language that is used by Be My AI and the other models um, often tells us what we should feel or ventures to say what a scene might mean, um, but it also has a certain Ikea press board feeling to it. You, you know it when you read it. And my concern is that we are spewing a ton of unlabeled large language model content into alt text fields and it's going to train more lar large language models and it's also going to dampen the 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 uh, inertia that we've had in recent years for human beings to describe things and to give their human read. So in my view, to observe new things and things that we know in new relationships is fundamentally human. And we can use these AI tools, but user-directed AI description is a necessary tool, but it's insufficient to full digital inclusion. And we can't back down on reinforcing the tenuous gains that alt text has already made. Let's not let AI reverse those gains. Um, I'll give you a, a, a quick example. I was on a sleeper train on the top bunk and my husband was on the bottom bunk and I was on the phone with a visual interpreter trying to figure out what train station to get off on. And the visual interpreter noticed that my husband's curly little head popped up. And I said, could you take his picture? And I got the best line of description I think I've ever gotten in my life. And I will not ever get something like this from an AI. He said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I can't do that. He ran away like a cat from a sprinkler. <laughs> so I want more of that. Speaking of language, large language models don't really do well with my identity. I identify as blind. I don't identify as low vision or visually impaired. All those terms are valid. They are not mine. Um, Claude, ChatGPT, Meta AI, and Copilot across the board will avoid the word blind. If I ask for techniques on how to do something as a blind person, I'll hear back about what you can do if you're a person who's visually impaired. These systems output person-first language by default, and person-first language is valid, but it is a preference. It is a strong preference that people have or do not have. And the thing is that when majority sighted folk come for information to the, to the LLMs, which they will, AI outputs will shape the language people choose to use going forward, especially when they're researching something they don't well understand. AI could and should include the full spectrum of language of disability identities. 
when I use descriptive AI, I'm living in a hypothesized world. What I'm being told at any moment could be true. It could be missing uh, critical data. We use now an AI app called Oco, and Oco reads pedestrian signals. It has a low but non-zero rate of false positives. In, in other words, it may say cross the street when you absolutely should not. Um, and the thing is that those false positives come with no warning about confidence threshold, and we don't have any data on what kinds of intersections or what conditions lead to more or fewer false positives. Um, so although the OCO company is acting in good faith and we're using it and loving it, we have to do risk management in real time with very little information. Um, descriptive AI, like Be My AI and Seeing AI and the others, misidentifies items and misses nuance. Um, so for example, I was at an Airbnb looking around in the host's drunk, junk drawer because I'm a nosy person. And I found the barbecue lighter and the nine volt batteries. And then I found a mystery tube and I was testing be my AI that week. So I said, let's see. And it said, oh, it's facial cleanser. And I said to myself, it's in this guy's junk drawer with the barbecue lighter, I bet not. And I went back to the OCR that I've been using since the early 2000s and friends, it was wood polish. I'm sure it would have been very cleansing. So, but the key thing to remember is that mistaken information is usually really plausible until you test it. So we have to teach users about evaluating their risk and what would be the consequences of taking action without doing lateral checking. And as soon as we're doing lateral checking, we're undermining some of the utility and frictionlessness of the AI. So there's always a tension there. We also, when we seek information about blindness, we're gonna come, with, come up with more uh, statements and misidentifications. Um, a couple of the things that I've been told by Google Gemini, um, I've been told that it's good to touch a blind person on the shoulder to get their attention. Please don't. Um, and also, if you're preparing any braille materials for your blind friends, be sure to use really dark ink. So moving on into what's missing. So that's what's there that shouldn't be there. Moving on to, to, to gaps. Um, if you ask any blind person, if you say, uh, is Braille a hard language to learn? We'll say Braille is not a language, it's a code. But for this purpose for today, Braille is almost like an under-resourced language. So the main uh, LLM contenders uh, can translate and use and quote unquote understand uh, dozens of languages. But Braille shares the feet the fate of under-resourced languages that we're hearing reported in the news are not well uh, well covered. Copilot, Claude, and ChatGPT 4.0, even ChatGPT 4.0 can't answer basic questions about how to form the letters of the Braille alphabet, let alone support a Braille user or bake Braille into graphics and diagrams. And that is a serious omission. Um, this is a place where affirmative advocacy is required to prioritize the types of data that people with various disabilities want and need from disability wisdom on how to do things to the ways that we communicate and the uh, specialized codes that we may use. AI is learning from our proud tradition of microaggressions. Um, on one of those occasions when uh, I explained to an AI, I explained to Copilot that I couldn't read a PDF and I really needed it to help to tell me what it said. It didn't help me, but it did say that it was hard. Sorry to hear that I'm blind. I don't know. I closed the app. Um, Claude, I thought it would be fun. And this is something that I really enjoy doing. I actually recommend it. Um, I gave Claude one of my papers that I wrote with some fellow researchers uh, after we had published. Um, and I said, what are some potential criticisms of our, of our approach? And it made the assumption that everybody on my team must be cited because we said we were all designers. And it criticized my paper because none of the researchers who wrote the paper were blind. Uh, ChatGPT has recommended that I have someone read me in an accessible PDF. Go have someone help you with that. Um, and my least favorite one, 
the, how many of y'all saw the chat GPT 4.0 video demo with the guide dog a couple weeks ago? Yeah. So guide dog is, uh, the, the guy hails a cab with the help of real time chat, chat GPT 4 Omni. And as he's getting into the cab, this really upbeat, um, performatively adoring voice says, that's such a good dog leading the way into the text. <laughs> Mm -mm. We've taught our AIs how to fuss unnecessarily over a guide dog who is doing an everyday thing. Yep. Um, moving on to some of what I do at the library, when I'm not doing basic training, we have a graphics lab where we produce tactile graphics and we're always on the lookout for more accessible workflows for doing that. Um, and ChatGPT and the others, um, any, any of the ones that create images, will verbally accede to and paraphrase and promise to follow basic tactile graphics standards that result in a readable tactile graphic um, and then fail because there is a loose coupling between the LLM and the generative piece. So kind of the LLM doesn't know exactly what the generative is doing and vice versa. Uh, so we see four failures. We see particularly chat GPT rendering a distracting background that comes up as tactile fuzz, even while promising that the background is transparent or white. It just cannot seem to handle that. I have to use a separate AI tool to make it happen. As I've already mentioned, none of the systems can integrate Braille. So all the chart makers, all the data analysis, the limit, uh, the utility of them is really limited for Braille and tactile users because Braille just cannot be included right now. Um, and a, the gener a generative AI linked to an LLM will often add unannounced decorative flourishes, gradients, and other elements that are not verbally described and so are not evident to the blind person. Um, and also, uh, LLMs tied to Gen AI often fail to recognize their own errors. So, for example, if there's illegible text, um, it will... Uh, often read it as though the text were correct. If there are errant or extra or missing lines, that often doesn't get called out because whatever the AI draws, the AI think, thinks makes sense. So I'm gonna come back to this question of, are we socializing the idea of surveillance when we adopt more AI for accessibility? So AI for accessibility can make a positive social impact and that's a really powerful marketing tool. Um, we need to remain aware of this when we consider AI that we use for description, because that is a short peer to a business case for having AI take over description. We are already seeing museums and nonprofits, uh, workers I'm hearing are being pressured to adopt AI workflows to mass describe legacy content instead of doing that backlog of work to have humans describe it. We're going to expect to see the same thing soon in video description. Um, and we're probably not far from seeing the same thing pushed on other disability groups. Um, once AI can sign, I can imagine we're gonna see it again. Um, and by can sign, I mean, can sign incredibly if you're not a sign language native user. Um, AI for business communication, AI that monitors something in order to protect someone. These are all compelling use cases that can garner pro broad acceptance but they're also susceptible to all of the misuses and the abuses, the potential for security breaches, the potential for constraining individual users and for providing a less than optimal accessibility experience is all baked in. And so we need to moderate that positive social impact case with some more granular data for folks that are considering implementing these tools. Um, I am seeing one of the most serious issues that I'm seeing, and I think I've got two more slides, one of the most serious issues that I'm seeing among um, my patrons is that I actually believe that AI can increase rather than decrease the cognitive load of folks who are trying to figure out what's true and what's credible. Um, if you've experienced the Google AI overview feature recently, you may have, you may have uh, experienced this. Um, many of us will remember, to, uh, will remember learning to recognize trustworthy sites back in 2000 by certain indicators, check the URL, look at the format and check the language, see if there are references. Today's searcher that's confronted with AI overview and similar features needs to identify 
what the AI content is, where it starts and stops, which if you're a screen reader user or anyone with non-standard literacy, that can be a challenge already. Then we need to estimate the plausibility of that AI output, figure out whether we want to double check and where we want to double check, and then evaluate whether references support the claims being made. Um, one of the newest things I'm seeing is a lot more citations, but then when you click through to the citation, it's a totally unrelated paper um, or a link that goes to information that contradicts what the LLM is saying. Just yesterday, I asked ChatGBT, which is now, quote unquote, working in real time, um, why is everybody so upset about congestion pricing in New York? What did the governor do? And the response that came back to me was that the governor altered the plan and it gave me like pretty incremental uh granular details on the governor's alternate plan for congestion pricing. But when I did my double check, it, what actually happened is that the whole congestion pricing program got halted. Um, and so people will see these reference links and say, oh, it's cited, it's it's okay. Um, and so that's gonna increase people's cognitive load. Um, if AI search is someone's only entry point and it is going to be marketed that way, I'm already seeing at least one of the descriptive AI tools um, Envision offering a conversational voice search that's just marketed to make things easier. It's not related to photos or anything. It's just um, there to inform users. Um, if you use AI search and knowledge as your only entry point, it will be very difficult to detect um, when AI answers are accurate or not. So I'm gonna come back to this really obvious thing that core accessibility is still a problem even for the developers of LLMs. ChatGPT, for example, Copilot and others have uh, focus issues, have unlabeled buttons, have accessibility issues that come and go. They're actually blind people teaching other blind people how to make a prompt that creates uh, headings when ChatGPT answers you so that you can actually jump to the ChatGPT answer. So these companies are Failing to follow accessible web and native mobile uh, mobile accessibility practices, which makes their tools harder for us to use. And it also just proves the point that uh, having LLMs around, using LLMs doesn't necessarily create born accessible content. We know that accessible overlays purporting to fix uh, web pages continue to perform really poorly. We know that in accessibility education, uh, that accessibility education isn't really part of most computer science programs. Um, and we know that we continue to produce inaccessible code. And if we continue to produce inaccessible code, that's what the LLM learns from, and that's how the LLM will learn to code. So again, to be mercenary, if for no other reason than to create tomorrow's training data, we still need to insist on born accessible software and hardware and not slap on the AI uh, Band-Aid. So I'd love for everyone to think about through the day and as you go back out into the world, these values that are in tension. Uh, a couple other things to think about. Should AI always say yes to access requests? So for example, if I get a picture that has adult content in it, maybe it was sent to me without my consent, AI won't tell me about that. Um, how should we handle the tension between sensitive content and processing it um, and the potential for abuse? and blind people's legitimate need to know. How much should AI notice things like ethnicity, gender, and age, imperfections in your appearance? Should descriptive AI be kind about the pictures that you take or should it be more of a critical friend? And how well do you need to understand AI prompting to make that decision for yourself? We talked about copyrighted material. So there are all of these issues that are in tension and as we move forward to define the future of what accessibility looks like um, as powered by AI, we need to continue to use a critical lens to consider the culture, to continue consider multiple values by multiple stakeholders that are intention. Um, and I think just to remain uh, vigilant and in communication so that we are shaping AI rather than the other way around. Thank you.